it's very important to understand that Kundalini process literally is that what bridges and brings and devours polarities. And it does that at every level, at every respective level. So the process itself, esoterically speaking, can be spoken of literally as that, a continued process of sublimation, this sublimation, this sublimation of polarities, whatever these polarities are. So it's not just this or that. It's not just uh, in the larger scheme of things, speaking of it in terms of how we are come here in a particular gender and the androgynous nature of the spirit here is therefore not known to us because the gender here, the narrative they're bringing, the cultural imprint, all this together, the DNA propensity that we inherited, all these acts and interacts in a certain way, that the gender here is what gives that, that forgive me, uh, this will be very fitting to say, a lopsided way through life. It can be very beautiful lopsided. It can be dressed in the most spectacular way lopsided. It can have big muscles or very, very extraordinarily princely uh, dress when it comes to man and woman, respectively. It can have uh, outwardly appear as healthy and proper and everything, but it is lopsided. Lopsided because one's access, one's connection, one's being is lived only from that tilted perspective towards gender orientation. And you'd be surprised, or you would not be surprised, perhaps you know this already very well, how this is one of the biggest predicaments in terms of what a proper awakening really is uh, exemplified by. So, next, of course, we could speak about the uh, polarities in terms of the more, well, they're not more cosmic because feminine and masculine, nothing gets more cosmic, nothing gets more universal than that. But let's say the polarities of the, what is carried here by the qualities of how masculine and feminine expresses itself, the lunar and the solar. So the <clears throat> masculine as the solar and the feminine as the lunar here, exemplified by that also what the Hatha Yoga is all about, right? The, the, the very, very sublimation of these energies till there is this possibility created when the true process of alchemical transformation can take place. Because up until there is this respective energetic currents that is all governed by breath anyway, and all orchestrated by the respective movements within respective channels, all this keeps everything intact. This whole mechanism behind the scenes, this whole anatomy here that cannot be looked through in my, by microscope or, is intact. So this bridging of polarities that leads to the sublimation is the very leitmotiv of all the yogas, but it is the job of Kundalini. So Kundalini is that what devours here the opposites. It devours these opposites at each of its turns, of each of its ascents. It does that. It does that. It brings them and churns them. It brings them and churns them. Brings them again and churns them. At each ascent, at each station, there is this greater churning of these polarities. So, how can that be done without internalization? It's impossible. So, it's as simple as that. Because all this is in turn governed by pranic currents anyway. So, rather, no, what I meant is, it is orchestrated and governed by none other than Kundalini herself, the goddess. But it is executed by pranic currents. So pranic currents as these forces 
they cannot be performing their functions adequately enough if there is not enough prana for that internal process. So therefore, internalization is, um, as a classic scenario. So in fact, when there is this internalization, work can be done. See? So it's something that has to be uh, acknowledged fully, understood. Hopefully it all coincides with overall trajectory of one's uh, life in terms of circumstances, because this also uh, can be spoken to how one can be uh, in a place where this is just everything just laid out just in an extraordinary manner. The whole combination. But it not always happened that way. Some people go through awakening amidst of their daily interactions and lives and obligations and responsibilities. So, but in your particular case, in the case that we are speaking to now, this is one of those maybe a luxurious, in that sense, this extraordinary uh, set of circumstances. So, this to be celebrated in a quiet way, celebrated in a sense of understanding how this is all contributing to what, effectively speaking, have to, bound to, and will pay off. Because obviously, it's also uh, <laughs> very important to bring this reminder for everyone here that it's not that we'll, it will make us into hermits for the rest of our lives. Even if at some point it may feel like as if we are becoming a hermit. I can tell you that, I can reassure you that there are phases. Shall we touch up on that? There are three distinctive phases in sadhana. If we are to speak about it in, in a traditional sense, I'm just simplifying it, making it very, very accessible. So there is a pre-awakening phase uh, where basically sadhana meant to create the possibility where one welcomes that awakening. In other words, it's a preparation. It's like school, university, something one prepares oneself for in life. That's the phase of sadhana, that pre, then the most maybe um, spoken about, the sadhana of the actual process itself. So when awakening takes place and sadhana becomes spontaneous, then this is known as that sudden of the process itself, so awakening itself. And uh, naturally, the post-awakening sadhana. In the post-awakening sadhana, it's all about reintegration, re-entering, coming back to, coming back to everything, coming back to the world fully, coming back to the all that, what at some point uh, we lost interest because there was no propensity, there was not enough prana. There was not enough life force to go out and illumine these aspects that are responsible for us wanting to do in the first place anything, wanting to do something. 